Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TBM webinar series. My name is Jim Rush. I'm editor of TBM, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce today's presentation titled Injection Grouting for Greater Groundwater Control Before, During, and After Tunnel Construction. For safe and secure tunneling operations, controlling, controlling groundwater is critical. Injection grouting is often planned as part of the pre-excavation phase, but can also be a reactionary unplanned step to solve unforeseen circumstances during and after construction. During this presentation, engineers, contractors, and owners will benefit from the knowledge of industry experts and practitioners on grouting materials and techniques specific to tunneling applications for stormwater, wastewater, and transportation, including public and private geotechnical projects. We encourage you to participate in the webinar by submitting questions for the question and answer session following the presentation and by completing the interactive poll that will be presented throughout the presentation. We'll go ahead and get started with our first poll, a Benjamin Media TBM Magazine poll. Uh, it asks for how many people are watching at your computer. So as you complete that, I'll go ahead and get started with the speaker introductions. We have Brian Jepson. Brian started working with Hess Products in Malad, Idaho as a general laborer in 1978 when he was a sophomore in high school. After jo other jobs throughout the years, including ready mix driver, general contractor, and eight years in the U.S. Air Force Reserves, Brian returned to Hess Pumice U.S. Grout in 1997 as QA manager, safety director, and research technician. Today, Brian is VP of Research and Development for Hess Pumice U.S. Grout and Hess Paws. And Avanti is the sole distributor of U.S. Grout's ultrafine and microfine cementitious grout. Our next speaker is Bill Lillico. Bill is a grouting specialist at Golder Associates in Mississauga, Ontario, with over 13 years of experience in the civil construction industry. For the past 11 years, he has focused solely on technical grouting services, and he has extensive experience in the design and installation of water cutoffs for mining, tunneling, and civil construction projects. Bill's experience includes developing grouting solutions, supervising work crews, and providing technical support for numerous chemical and cementitious grouting projects across North America. We'll also have Britt Babcock. Britt is the Vice President of Sales at Avanti International in Houston, Texas, where he oversees the sales and support team and provides technical service support to grouting consultants, engineers, contractors, and owners. Britt has a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Colorado State University and has 18 years of experience in the design and construction field. He's a licensed professional engineer in Texas and Colorado, having practiced geotechnical engineering for over 12 years. His previous work experience includes performing preliminary studies, geologic hazards evaluations, slope stability analysis, and managing field and laboratory testing of construction materials such as soils, bedrocks, asphalts, and concretes. So as uh, Britt joins us, we'll go ahead and get started with the first of the interactive polls. The poll question is, beyond workforce safety, what are the risks associated with uncontrolled groundwater? Choices are loss of ground stability, tunnel flooding, construction delays, and cost increases. So now I'd like to turn it over to Britt Babcock. All right. Thank you, Jim. I'll wait just for a few seconds for the results to come in from that survey. Looks like loss of ground stability is leading the pack here. Uh, more coming in. Wait just a few more seconds here. We're split between ground stability now and tunnel flooding. Few and construction delays and uh, cost increases. But it looks like loss of ground stability is the predominant response that we're getting. And it uh, continues to stay the most at just over 50%. <clears throat> All right. Let's go ahead and move forward. It's ironic that loss of stand ground stability was not ironic, but uh, fortuitous that that was our primary concern because that's one of the primary goals for injection grouting. Let's talk about the two goals. The first is to stabilize soils and rock, which helps prevent that loss. The second one is also to control groundwater. Uh, those are the two primary goals that really grouting addresses in any application, including uh, 
the topic of this presentation, tunneling. We're going to cover three different aspects of the tunneling process and when grouting is applied. The first is pre-excavation grouting. That's grouting prior to the TBM advancing into the excavation or in mining towards the tunnel alignment. It can occur from the surface in front of where the, uh, within the alignment itself to stabilize those soils or to control that groundwater. We're also going to talk about during the tunnel construction process, which is um, either out in front of the TBM that's depicted here or behind the TBM in the precast sections here. Uh, it could be cracks or joints within the precast sections. We're also going to talk about post-completion grouting. This is years after service has been in place for the, it could be, a, well, it could be immediately following or it could be years after, I should say, uh, of grouting within the tunnel uh, after it's been in service. But before we dive into where those grouts are applied in those situations, let's define the type of grouts that are in the industry. There's really two primary types of grouts. There's cement grouts, which comprises of the ordinary Portland cement, as well as the ultra-fine cement or cementitious grouts, as they're coined in some aspects. There's also solution grouts, which also coined chemical grouts. Within that, those fall into two subcategories of polyurethane grouts or the foams. And they, those further spread into hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Then there's also the chemically reactive grouts that are the acrylamides, the acrylates, the acrylics, and the sodium silicates. <clears throat> the cement grouts and cementitious grouts comprise, again, of the Portland cement type 3 with an average micron size of 15 to 20 in size. Brian Jeff is going to give the more detail on this in his presentation as well, but this is just a quick snapshot. Whereas the cementitious grouts, uh, consists of both the micro, of the microfine, ultrafine, and superfine, averaging in eight microns for the microfine, three microns for the ultrafine, and, and superfine of 1.5 microns. The predominantly used grout here is the ultrafines in the marketplace at three microns. Uh, the chemically reactive grouts are all two components. You mix A and B and to form either an acrylic, an acrylamide, or an uh, acrylate. Uh, or to form a sodium silicate. With the acrylamide acrylates and acrylics, they form a gel and when intermixed with the soil matrix, uh, create a very watertight, permeable, uh, non-permeable, impermeable, watertight seal. And so they're predominantly used for water control. Whereas sodium silicates, their predominant use is a structural application and temporary support, such as scenarios. Um, the polyurethane grouts, again, fall back into or can, are comprised of the hydrophilics and the hydrophobics, uh, both foams. Uh, the hydrophilics have a strong affinity for water. They react when they're a single component and react when they intermix with the water and create that foam. They don't require much water to react. They will have a catalyst or an accelerator in mixed with it. Once upon contact with water, will react. And then they can handle the wet and dry cycles. Uh, they have a little to no affinity for water, whereas the hydrophilics like to have to be in that moist environment. Um, the polyurethane grouse can have a low range of viscosity down to 35 to 50 centipoise to as high as 3,000, one centipoise being that of water. The reaction times for polyurethanes can be anywhere from a few seconds upwards to a minute. Now that we've defined the types of grouts, let's talk about their use and which ones are typically used in the different stages of tunneling. Pre-excavation grouting generally is a large-scale grouting operation covering large areas, requiring a lot of grout. And generally, the type of soils or rock that are being um, grouted will take or are amenable to a type 3 cement or a sodium silicate. So generally, in pre-excavation grouting, those are the predominantly two products that are used in those scenarios. <clears throat> the injection types uh, are compensation grouting or permeation grouting, compensation being kind of a building of a mass, if you will, to, to group the grout together or the soil mass together or the rocks, whereas permeation grouting is permeating through the soils. <clears throat> Tunnel construction, this is actually during the TBM. There's two aspects here, either ahead of the TBM, as depicted in this picture, or behind the TBM as depicted in here with the precast sections. 
uh, ahead of the TBM. Generally, again, these are large quantities. You can see that this is grouting out in front of the shield or in front of the face. They're uh, trying to stabilize or control groundwater prior to mining through those sections. Um, grout types generally used for that is a type 3 cement, again, or an ultrafine cement. Uh, in special circumstances, a chemically reactive can be used, um, the acrylates or the acrylates. Uh, sodium silicates do get used in, a, in a pretty predominant situations as well when grouting out in front of the TBM. Probably the majority would be the cements and the sodium silicates, again, in this situation. Now behind the tunnel, the TBM, uh, generally these are smaller quantities, what I would consider more localized grouting when they're focusing predominantly on uh, the joints of the cracks or pick holes. In those situations, we're going to predominantly use urethanes. There is an exception where they maybe do compensation grouting or, or uh, whatever coin modified contact grouting, where they're using cements to help control groundwater inflows out into the soil mass around the rock or around the tunnel. <clears throat> now, post-completion grouting, after the tunnel's been in service for some time, either immediately or, or several years later, generally this is going to fall into two different types of grouting techniques, or grouting areas, if you will, localized grouting or global grouting. In local, localized grouting, again, we're focusing on just the cracks in the joints, whereas more globally we'd be looking at curtain walls behind the tunnel structure or enca fully encapsulating the tunnel structure. In localized grouting, again, this is cracks and joints. Predominantly, it's going to be polyurethane. It's either hydrophilic or hydrophobic. You can see here is an example of the crack being injected. Whereas in global grouting, talking curtain walls or encapsulation, the types of grouts generally used are acrylamides or acrylates in this situation or acrylics. Uh, it's larger areas. You get great spread. You may be fully encapsulating the grout, so it's a cost per injectable gallon benefit to use these type of chemically reactive grouts. Urethanes can be used and are used on occasion um, for curtain grouting uh, scenarios. <clears throat> now that we've talked about those two types of, or those three types of aspects of tunneling, what are the two types of primary grouting that occurs when we're either outside of the TBM alignment or grouting within the TBM alignment? It's, really falls down into two types, either penetration grouting or what we hear rock grouting or permeation grouting or soils grouting. Again, penetration grouting is the grouting of the geologic features, fractures, cracks, planes, things of that nature, whereas permeation is in the soils, the sands and gravels. I've got matrix porosity in here as well, although that occurs in a bedrock formation and grouts like a soil. <clears throat> the type of grouts that are used for penetration grouting uh, predominantly are just ordinary Portland cement, type 3. Again, most cracks and fissures will take that type of material, so that's what's prominently used. Once they aren't able, the ultrafine cements can be used uh, in that scenario and, and are often used. Polyurethanes can be used as well, but nowhere nearly as much as the OPC or ordinary Portland cement. The controlling factor on that really comes down to aperture width, and we won't go into too much detail on that, but uh, matrix porosity, again, although it's a rock, I've got it under rock, it still, it still grouts like uh, soil. Then permeation grouting or soil grouting, uh, again, that's sands and gravels, generally is less than 20% passing to minus 200. Almost any one of the grouts, basically any one of the grouts can be injected into a soil, but there's con controlling factors that dictate that. And that's a whole other presentation at another time, but uh, uh, anyone, any grout consultant can help determine uh, what soils will take what grouts at any given time. So with that, I will stop my presentation. We're going to stop and look and watch a video uh, on the use of acrylic grouts in uh, the geotechnical market space. And immediately following that, Mr. Bill Lillico is going to uh, present. Thank you. Acrylamide chemical grout dates back to the 1950s for soil stabilization. In the 1960s, municipalities began using the same grout to stop water leaks in mainline sewers. In 1985, the U.S. Department of Energy began a program to study and test seven different grout formulations to determine the best product to encapsulate radioactive waste buried after the Manhattan Project in 1951. After 10 years of testing, in 1995, 
the U.S. DOE concluded AV100 acrylamide grout was the product of choice based on the following criteria. The acrylamide grout had a 362-year half-life underground. Because it had no suspended solids, it could permeate anywhere water travels. It reduced the permeability of the grouted soil and rock better than other grout formulations. And according to the 97 Geo Institute ASCE proceedings, was best suited to withstand nuclear bombardment. A 10-year pilot program was implemented for using acrylamide to encapsulate hazardous waste. And finally, in 2005, after 20 years of testing and monitoring the performance of the grout, AV100 acrylamide grout was used to encapsulate 9.5 million gallons of buried radioactive waste. Today, chemical grout is used to control groundwater in a number of industries and applications, including soil stabilization, hazardous waste containment, mines, subways, and tunnels, concrete and earthen dams, new construction cold joints, slab lifting, underwater applications, tunneling and TBMs, pre-excavation and dewatering, beneath and around underground structures, and mainline sewers, laterals, and manholes. Significant advancement in the uses of acrylamide chemical grout include subways, tunnels, tunnel boring machines, and pre-excavation grouting. As miners create horizontal and vertical tunnels, they often encounter layers of the earth with high groundwater content. When they do, their only options are to pump the water out or to seal the network of water-bearing cracks so they can mine through the water-bearing zone. Tunnel boring machines are specifically designed with a cutter head to cut through an expected type of strata. But when geologies change, acrylamide grout may be used to stabilize the area in front of the machine so that it can continue on its path. In what may be the largest chemical grouting project in the U.S., the city of Dearborn, Michigan used a pre-excavation grouting technique to allow for installation of underground storage tanks. To prevent inflow from artesian groundwater conditions, tens of thousands of gallons of grout were injected via grout holes from the surface, essentially waterproofing the shaft footprint at the base of the caisson. This technique allowed for excavation of soil and rock in fairly dry conditions after the caisson had successfully landed. The concrete walls, seven and a half feet thick, now have the capacity to hold over eight million gallons of sewage. The city of Dearborn successfully created several tanks, up to 120 feet in diameter and 150 feet deep, protecting the environment from sewer overflows. From stabilizing soil to stopping leaks to controlling groundwater, after 60 years of innovation and across multiple industries, new uses for acrylamide chemical grout are on the horizon. Okay, well that brings us to our next uh, speaker is Bill Lillico. He's grouting specialist at Golder Associates. So Bill, you want to take it away? Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in uh, today's webinar. Over the course of my uh, contracting career and time as a grouting specialist with Golder Associates, I've encountered a wide range of tunneling applications and executed and overseen many tunneling grouting projects. Today I will be sharing several of these key projects. Over the years, um, there we go. Sorry, guys. Over the years. Um, over the next several slides, I would like to present some of the real-life case histories where groundwater inflow problems are solved using a, a variety of injection grouting techniques from either um, polyurethane water-activated materials to acrylics. Um, here we have uh, encountered moderate inflow conditions in a precast segmental transit tunnel being commissioned in Toronto, Ontario. Leaks are infiltrating the precast tunnel segments here and creating ice buildup during the winter months. 
Not all construction crews had to be used to manually remove all of this ice, which was delaying the construction schedule. I've seen uh, here leaks were observed infiltrating between the precast segments themselves. Um, these leak locations were repaired by drilling and injecting through the segments with water activated polyurethane. A highly expansive, quick setting, semi rigid product was selected for this project to account for the movement of the concrete due to Canada's harsh climate. Single component water activated polyurethane can be easily adjusted on site by changing the dosage of the activator component to solve minor, moderate, and severe inflow, uh, severe leaks. Further down this sister tunnel, um, smaller spot leaks were encountered and fully sealed by polyurethane injection as well. Small drilling and injection equipment were selected to be mobilized for this project due to the long distance between the leak locations in this tunnel. Injectable tubing systems are becoming a more common form of water stop and tunneling today. For those not familiar, uh, they are perforated tubes that are embedded in the concrete joints and then covered by a concrete pour to be injected at a later date, only if necessary. So if they're dry and not leaking, sometimes they're left alone, and then if they're actively leaking and draining water, they're injected um, right away. They should be installed at strategic locations like coal joints and at shaft head wall locations. Not all tunnels and tunnel leaks are solved quickly. This is an example of a hard rock tunnel with severe water inflow problems. Uh, large jack leg drills and mechanical injection packers were utilized on this project to pump large volumes of polyurethane resin and to seal the large inflows. What tunnel crews had spent weeks on injecting thousands of bags of Portland cement took only one shift with polyurethane resin. When severe inflow conditions are injected with a poor material selection, the leaks usually persevere. Typically, cement grouts have a slow set time and do not effectively shut off leaks unless using appropriate admixture or sometimes flash setting agents. With the right additives and flash setting agents, even cement grout can be injected and set in minutes or seconds. Using flash setting agents takes years of experience and very close attention to detail. This photo illustrates uh, the injection packers installed directly into the rock mass. They're angled drill holes were strategically drilled to intercept the flow path and to target the water source for injection grouting. Here's a project where Avanti AV118 Duraflex acrylic gel was utilized to waterproof expansion joints inside a pedestrian tunnel joining the subway system and a major government building in Toronto. The AV118 was selected to fill the joint and permeate the soils and gravels in close proximity to the outside of the concrete surface. This illustrates what the finished expansion joint looked like prior to removals, prior to drilling, and prior to injection grouting. Often, the severity of water damage and the level of deterioration isn't effectively estimated or seen until after the removals. Seen here is a grouting crew injecting AV118 through small mechanical packers into the floor of the expansion joint. Hoses are, um, should always be organized like this to eliminate trip hazards on site. 
This uh, illustrates a custom built grow plant for mining, for mixing and pumping uh, Vontese acrylic injection products. Uh, drop sheets and protective plastic need to be used to protect the tunnel, floor, and walls. Um, proper PPE is required to be done by grouting crews. And materials and hoses need to be carefully color coded to avoid cross contamination of these types of grouting materials. Colored dyes are utilized to clearly identify A and B components and to monitor leaks during the grouting process. The AV-118 was delivered by a stainless steel uh, plural component pump through the six inch mechanical injection packers uh, as seen here, uh, spaced approximately two feet on center around the expansion joint. Due to the excellent planning, uh, the work co was completed over three consecutive weekends with no interruptions to the subway. At this time, we're ready for our next poll question. Okay, thank you, Bill. Yeah, the next poll question is, what are the conditions for selecting ultrafine versus ordinary Portland cement, or OPC? Your choices are particle size, permeability of soil, fracture width, and viscosity differences. So we'll give you a few seconds to uh, put in your responses. And then uh, welcome Brian Jepson with Hess Pumice U.S. Grout is our next speaker. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we'll wait for a minute or so while these uh, responses come back in. Looks like we're uh, getting permeability of soil being leading the pack right now with about 40%. Give another couple of seconds and we'll Move forward. Okay. Uh, in reality, as you looked at those response options, uh, all four of those are definitely possibilities to consider. Uh, we had uh, the majority coming in with permeability of soil. Uh, next in line was the fracture width was something to consider with the, the particle size following up there and then the viscosity being uh, also the consideration there. Uh, appreciate your participation in that poll. Uh, as mentioned, each of these factors are really something that we need to consider as we're selecting between OPC and ultrafine cementitious grout. To uh, reiterate what Britt had said earlier, ordinary Portland cement grout is used probably 95% of the time, primarily due to cost. And in reality, if you're able to effectively grout a job with OPC, then by all means, that is exactly what you should be doing. I don't think we're ever going to get any argument on that point. However, if OPC is not adequately permeating the soil or penetrating the rock fractures, then the next consideration would be to move on to an ultrafine cementitious grout. Certainly, Bill and Britt are the field application experts on the webinar today, and I appreciate being able to participate with and learn from them, along with the rest of you in the audience. Um, in my role as a producer of ultrafine grout, I would just like to take the next couple of minutes and briefly address some of the physical characteristics of ultrafine cementitious grout and a few of the characteristics that differentiate ultrafine from ordinary Portland cement. Uh, as we saw in the poll question, there are primarily four basic reasons why we would consider choosing ultrafine grout over OPC and to meet the project. One of those being particle size, as demonstrated here again by this slide. Uh, if OPC is being refused by the soil or the rock conditions uh, and more complete grouting is necessary, then one of the reasons for refusal could simply be due to the particle size of the grout. Depending upon the matrix of the soil or the aperture of the rock fixture, the void space being filled may simply be too small for the OPC to physically penetrate. A good rule of thumb is very similar to the one used in regular concrete construction, which is that generally speaking, the solid particle needs to be two to three times smaller than the opening to allow for adequate flow of the material. The rationale behind this thinking is 
due to the possibility that two particles may indeed line up and get wedged in the opening, but it is much less likely for three particles to create a blockage. As Britt mentioned earlier, the average particle size of type 3 Portland cement is 15 to 20 microns, which is really quite small considering that the human hair comes in between 70 and 100 microns. However, if your void space or fracture with width is less than 50 to 60 microns, then you can see that this is going to cause a problem. As you can see from this visual, the average particle size of ultrafine grouts come in right around 3 to 5 microns. And to put this in perspective, 3 microns would be equivalent to the solid particles found in smoke. So very fine. Uh, the ultrafine particle allows us to effectively and consistently grout openings as small as 10 to 15 microns. Now you've seen this slide before. Britt was uh, using this as well. But here is the actual still photo taken from an X-ray video monitoring system that was used at the nuclear waste isolation pilot project in New Mexico several years ago. Um, here we see an ultrafine grout flowing through a 7 micron fissure. So this is an opening of 7 microns right in there. And the video X-ray was able to record that grout passing through that opening. Pretty amazing technology when you think about it. But then again, it was a government project, so they were able to afford some of the testing and research that needed to go on with that. And it was a very uh, important project, as you can see here in this next slide. Um, this is a color close-up from that same project that shows how the grout uh, represented by the dark lines here in this salt uh, particle, they effectively filled the cracks as small as 6 microns. Um, this grout was actually designed by the Department of Energy through their Sandia National Laboratory facility. And they, their purpose was to effectively seal these micro fractures in order to contain the nuclear waste within these giant salt caverns that were located about a mile beneath the surface of the ground. So they excavated out these giant salt caverns and then to make sure that the nuclear uh, waste did not permeate outside of the caverns, they grouted the caverns so that they would contain the grout, or excuse me, contain the nuclear waste. Here's an example of one of the intake tunnels at Lake Mead where the ultrafine was successfully used in a pre-excavation grouting application. The grouting contractors would drill horizontal pilot holes uh, about 80 feet long in advance of the excavation, sort of like Blit has shown in another diagram. And they would pressurize the grout, effectively squeezing it into the fissures of the rock in advance of the large tunnel boring equipment. Uh, this effectively prevented excess water from entering the tunnel allowing them to move forward with the project. Not only was this important for keeping excess water out, but with the tremendous head pressures of the water up above, you can imagine how hazardous that could be if there was a significant leak. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't want to be there if that were to happen. Here we have a great visual that puts the particle size of various sprouting materials into perspective. As shown here, ultrafine can be used to permeate most soils that have at least some type of porosity. The generally accepted guidelines being a sieve analysis on the soil that indicates at least 20% passing the minus 200 or the 75 micron sieve. Much less than that, and you start to get into clay type soils, which are usually not amenable to any type of grouting. As you can see from the chart, OPC will grout to a certain extent. Then we move to the ultrafine cements. And finally, for the toughest jobs, we move to the acrylates and the acrylamide grouts. Finally, uh, this is an interesting demonstration uh, that, they, that we call the sand column demo. Uh, we do this each year at the annual grouting short courses uh, held here at the University of Texas, Austin, and also uh, Colorado School of Mines. Uh, this demo shows how various grout solutions can permeate vertically up a column of sand 
at pressures uh, less than 10 psi. The demonstration is great for also highlighting some of the other factors that we need to consider when using ultrafine grouts. Uh, one interesting result from this demonstration, which I believe was somewhat unexpected, was that particle size was not the only factor, or perhaps even the main factor when it comes to soil permeation. The other characteristics that came into play as uh, represented in the poll were the stability and the viscosity of the grouts. Stability of a grout mix, uh, which is indicated in how well the solids of the grout stay in solution, are typically tested through a standard bleed test as well as pressure filtration testing. It's important to keep in mind here that the desirability of these characteristics may be very project specific. Although in many cases a stable grout is desired, there are certainly applications where it would be better uh, if the grout was actually not stable. This is why it's so important to have a knowledgeable grouting consultant like Bill Lillico on the job. You're welcome for the plug there, Bill. <laughs> Another consideration would be the apparent viscosity, which is tested using a simple marsh funnel device, which measures flowability. This can be affected by uh, changing the water cement ratio, as well as the addition of high range water reducers, which are uh, more commonly referred to as superplasticizers. There are a few different choices of super peas available in the industry. The most uh, common and are currently the naphthalene sulfonate based and the polycarboxylate based chemicals. Uh, but we'll save that discussion for another day. So that's really all I have regarding the ultrafine grouts today. We've uh, just covered the basics, but I'm anxious for us to get some more actual application of the various grouts. So we'll move now to the next segment of the webinar with Bill, uh, who will teach us more about the criteria to be considered in selecting the cor correct grout material. But before we turn the time over to Bill, we have one more poll question for you. Please take a moment to participate in this poll question. Okay, thank you, Brian. So we'll get started with the uh, final poll question for today. Uh, the question is, what is the most important criteria for choosing a grout type for controlling groundwater? Is it inflow volume, inflow pressure, residence time or reaction time, or groundwater quality? So if you uh, please Submit your responses, and then we'll welcome back Bill Lillico for the final part of the presentation. Thanks very much. I'm just curious to see what kind of responses come in here. It's looking like uh, residence time and reaction time are, are neck and neck with pressure and volume. Um, in my experience in the field, all four of these criteria are correct and important factors. Um, for example, uh, groundwater quality wasn't picked heavily here, but in uh, heavily saline conditions, your, gray, your cement grow would uh, set up and react um, extremely quickly potentially on a project, and then you don't get uh, the penetration you need to uh, on the material. So all four of these uh, factors are very important. Selecting the most appropriate grouting material ultimately and having an effective reaction time is the most critical for solving groundwater inflow problems. With that, we'll, we'll head back to uh, the last leg of my presentation and uh, go from there. Tunnel grouting projects can be pre-designed and executed, but also unplanned emergency grouting projects arise uh, often. This next project is a combination of two of those, of both of those. Um, up in British Columbia, Canada, a large six meter wide by five and a half meter high tunnel was attempted to be excavated for an 81 megawatt hydroelectric facility. On this site, shutdowns due to avalanches were definitely an issue. Heading through the portal, water was 
already severely infiltrating the tunnel. The further they got, the more sump pumps were installed, um, ejecting water to the surface retention ponds. Arriving at the face was a completely unanticipated inflow condition, which exceeded approximately 2,100 gallons per minute, which is around 8,000 liters per minute. Routine power failures happened, kicking off some pumps, and this flood, uh, this tunnel flooded several times over the course of the project. Uh, really frustrating when you're battling winter weather conditions and in this kind of uh, site. A series of over 34-inch Schedule 80 10-foot long steel sandpipes were installed to inject the leaking rock mass. It took two weeks on 24-hour shift rotations to stop the inflows and to seal just the face. Initially, it took a combination of both cement grouting techniques, polyurethane injection grouting, and the use of cement and sodium silicate-assisted grouting techniques. An Atlas Copco T40 drill rig with an eight-rod handling system was uh, the drill that they had on site. It's, it's actually meant as a surface drill, but actually worked quite well in this tunnel uh, situation. Um, the handling system situation, the rod handling system on the drill, sorry, um, eliminated uh, men actually doing the rod changes. Uh, and when you're drilling this much for this long, um, I was surprised that uh, and happy that this machine held up for the entire project without any serious downtime. Following the face injection, the project became more planned. Um, three 42-meter, 140-foot-long cover grouting programs were executed after sealing the face. All 30 holes were advanced one rod at a time. They were drilled, water pressure tested, and grouted. Um, low pressure, high volume water was intersected throughout the rock mass the, the deeper we advanced in front of the heading. Um, the water pr pressure testing of each of these holes ultimately determined which grout and the grout mix uh, determined for the, the program. Each and every hole was grouted to 12 rods deep, providing a grouted umbrella curtain surrounding the tunnel. The grouted rock mass displaced the groundwater and facilitated the successful excavation of the rest of this tunnel. Over 210,000 liters, 55,000 gallons of HE cement grout was injected during the first cover. This was followed by over 250,000 liters of US grout, ultrafine VX, which is like 60, 66,000 gallons over the next two cover grouting programs in the months to follow. Here is an example, I back up one, of a grouting container mobilized directly into the tunnel, plumbed with power and water, and, an, and a dust collection system to let the guys safely mix and place grout. Uh, we've got a coil mixer to an agitator tank, and then a 3L8 Moino pump feeding grout to the face. Um, next is an example of um, some of the basic real-time monitoring equipment that can be used on a grouting project, um, electric, electromagnetic flow meters, and inline gauge savers to monitor both flow and pressure. Large tunnel shafts usually contribute unplanned sources of infiltration. Shaft head walls, 
seen here typically are the primary source of infiltration. This unplanned scenario seen here is a typical cold joint where polyurethane injection with a flex flexible resin product would help solve these types of conditions. Annular void grouting are more often planned, those types of projects. Um, slip line tunnels usually have known annular volumes and can be backfilled with flowable fills, sand cement grouts, and more commonly today, cellular concrete. This tunnel shaft was used to jack precast concrete hose pipes in place, which housed a liner pipe, a steel liner pipe that had to be grouted with cellular concrete. It was a longer distance tunnel and because the cellular concrete is so light and flowable, it was an easy uh, choice for this type of project. Seen in set are a series of injection pipes used to complete the injection operation down here. Often hose tunnels, like the precast concrete pipes, um, have active leaks that need to be resolved prior to annular grouting. Massive uh, water leaks inside these hose pipes dilute the grouts, uh, specifically with cellular concrete, is, uh, is detrimental to the, the cellular concrete. Um, also, when these large concrete pipes are used as gravity sewer pipes, um, local municipalities don't want to be treating clean groundwater at their water treatment plants. The photo above illustrates the grouted annular space uh, between the concrete host pipe and the steel, sorry, yeah, between the steel. This is a vent pipe daylighting from a backfilled excavation from one of these jobs. Um, signaling the end of the annular fill. Often a sea snake camera can be utilized uh, down these pipes to monitor inside the annular space and in real time watch the filling operation happen. This cap and leg tunnel and cap and leg tunnels are less common but used on utility jobs, um, tight utility jobs, and uh, busy city streets. This one here was faced with groundwater and flowing sands and made it for a very serious challenge. This civil infrastructure project was very close to a possible sinkhole situation. There were sidewalks right above and buildings within four, four to five feet of the excavation, which made it about less than 20 feet above the entrance to this man-made tunnel. Grouting crews entered this narrow workspace and injected water-activated polyurethane to stabilize the flowing sands and displace the water. Steel pipes were advanced ahead of this face through the lagging over multiple phases to be able to hand mine and hand tunnel through this poor ground. A sinkhole was definitely averted on this site. Flowing water and silt needs to be addressed quickly and by professionals. Um, in tunnel shafts, hitting flowing conditions is definitely unplanned. Um, this is a 12 meter deep shaft, one of three that was poured with a concrete support wall used to install horizontal sleeve pipes for a curtain grouting project to grout the adjacent soils beside these shafts above and prior to a TBM excavation. When the steel standpipes could not be installed due to the flowing water and soil, the stabilization grouting program was designed and implemented. 
Below is a shot of the cord holes for the uh, standpipes um, showing the flowing water and soil conditions. Once the entire back of this concrete wall was drilled out and grouted with polyurethane to bind up the soils and push the water away, the standpipes were successfully installed and sealed in place to start the cover grouting activities that would follow. Uh, thank you very much, folks. I appreciate the opportunity. This concludes my presentation on planned versus unplanned uh, tunnel grouting projects. At this time, I will turn the focus back to Jim Rush for the QA session. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Bill. So yes, that does indeed bring us to the uh, question and answer session. So you're still there's still time to submit questions if you haven't done so already. So I will go ahead and get started. I'll just throw out the question, and uh, we have uh, Britt, Bill, and Brian available to uh, to ch chime in and, and answer them. So uh, first question here is, what is the life expectancy for this type of grouts? Uh, perhaps you can address uh, grout in general. Uh, do we have do we have to replace the grout after ten years, or will it stay forever? Um, Jim, I'll go ahead and jump on answering that question. This is Britt Babcock. Uh, it, the lifespan of the different grouts varies, right? We, to go back to our three primary types, we've got, or two primary types, our cementitious and chemical grout, or cement grouts and chemical grouts. Um, let me address the cement grouts first. The cement grouts, uh, regardless of whether it's a type, and have very, very long lifespans. Um, I've heard anywhere from 100 to 200 years in the ground. Uh, they don't, uh, you know, I've heard varying answers from different professionals around the country. Uh, when we get into the chemical grouts, the chemical grouts uh, have two subcategories. We've got the polyphones and then we've got the uh, chemically reactive. Uh, let me address the foams first. Uh, generally, the foams, depending on the environment they're in, can, and we expect them to survive the lifespan of the structure. Um, adverse water conditions can have an effect on chemical on urethane foams, uh, depending on what chemistry is in there. Uh, but it would have to be very adverse. Um, uh, but generally, the life of the structure is 75 to 100 years. Uh, when we get into the chemically reactive, now that that's kind of a two-part answer. We have acrylics, uh, the acrylamides, and the uh, acrylates. Um, the acrylamides and the acrylates have been uh, tested by the Department of Energy to have, you know, the acrylamide has over 360-year lifespan, and the acrylates were tested in the 50, 54-year lifespan. And then when we address the sodium silicates in regards to that, sodium silicates are believed to have about 2 to 10-year lifespan, uh, roughly. Um, and hence why they're considered a temporary uh, structural situation. So I'll okay. pass it back to you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, the next question, is vibration for grout consolidation a consideration? So uh, perhaps related to... Uh, uh, structures, nearby structures, or things of that nature. Anybody want to tackle that one? Uh, Bill, do you understand what he's asking? Is vibration for grout consolidation a consideration? You know what, Britt? Um, concrete that's vibrated, we, we all know why that's done. Right. Um, injection grouting with cementitious products um, is done by selecting the material with the proper particle size for the soils and the and the rock fracture networks you're injecting. So, geez, uh, I never considered using a vibration technique in soils before. So, no, I I don't have experience with that type of technique. But uh, using a stable grout material with the proper uh, design for the Soil conditions you're working in is typically uh, provides the permeation that you're you're looking for, but that's um, a very interesting comment, and 
just not something I've considered before. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so for the next question regarding atmospheric conditions, uh, the conditions are different 175 feet below the surface. How does that affect grouting? Well, um, I can offer a, a few comments on that. When, when you're working deep underground in a tunnel or a mine or the bottom of a shaft, you've, you've obviously got the different head pressure of water working against you, but you've also got uh, different temperatures uh, of groundwater working against you, against you as well. So it's, it's really important to be taking, taking samples and doing your, your checks of all these types of things when you're designing your grout mixes and placing those materials. Okay. So what is your best choice when performing curtain grouting behind the existing tunnel liner? So the best choice when performing curtain grouting behind the existing tunnel liner. What is the best choice? This is Britt. What is your best choice for performing curtain grouting behind the existing tunnel liner? Uh, it's of my opinion, and I'm sure opinions vary, but when you're grouting behind a tunnel liner, I think your best choice would going to be a chemically reactive grout, uh, an acrylamide or an acrylate, for multiple reasons. One, uh, just from a sheer cost for injectable gallon, I believe, is going to be uh, by and far the best price in regards to an acrylamide um, and an acrylate, uh, more so probably acrylamide. Or <clears throat> but then you've also got a very thin material that's also going to travel well behind the liner, uh, whether regardless of the soil material behind there. So, uh, and you've got long set times. Uh, the acrylics, acrylates, and acrylamides have um, anywhere from a few seconds upwards to multiple hours, as much as 10 hours for controllable set times. Obviously, that's a pretty extreme situation for a tunnel, but tunnel liner. Uh, but, I mean, you can control it out several minutes, 10, 15, 20 minutes if you needed to. Uh, with a urethane, you don't have that kind of control. You're pretty limited at how much travel you can get. So um, the uh, chemically reactive grouts like acrylamides, acrylates, and acrylics uh, are commonly used in that tunnel liner situation, so they're a great possible solution for that scenario. And what I believe to be the best. Great, I, I agree with you. Um, I've encountered one scenario which was uh, unique, though. So, um, very small diameter tunnel liner placed in um, excavated shale. And uh, it was determined that the shale moves and the annular space between that liner and the excavation did need to be filled with an annular grout. But um, Water inflow wasn't the primary issue. It was the forces exerted by the native rock on the concrete liner pipe that was being used. They were, they were concerned that it would get fractured and damaged. So uh, actually a cellular concrete, a very porous, pervious cellular concrete was, was pumped um, so that it was compressible in case the rock formation shifted or moved and wouldn't affect the uh, concrete tunnel. Yeah, good point. I was addressing it from a water control perspective, and I, I think kind of what you just described was a more structural application. Would that be a fair analysis? Absolutely, yep. Okay. Well, we got a lot of good questions coming in, but unfortunately, to, to keep things on, on time, we're going to have to uh, to close it out. Uh, but anybody who did submit questions, we will address those offline. So we have your email addresses. We'll get those answers to you. Uh, so I appreciate everyone uh, submitting questions and, and taking part in that. Uh, so also uh, being sent your way, we will have a, uh, the promise document. It's a copy of the, the article, Sorting Out the Grout, so you can be looking for your uh, looking at your inboxes for that document to come your way as well. So again, I would like to thank everybody for t attending today's presentation.
especially like to thank our speakers, Brian Jepson, Bill Lillico, and Britt Babcock, and their respective companies, Tess Pumice, U.S. Grout, uh, Golder Associates, and Avante International, for making the presentation possible. Just a couple of quick reminders before we go. We will have an archived version of this presentation available on tunnelingonline.com, and all, attendee, uh, all registered attendees will receive email notification when that is available. Also, we have uh, CEUs and PDHs available, and to, uh, to get those, you need to complete the request form, which is available under the event resources portion of this, uh, the, the website or the, uh, the screen here. On the left-hand portion of the screen, you'll see the event resources tab. Click on that and get the, uh, the copy of the form to get your CEUs, PDHs. So uh, finally, we ask that you uh, complete the exit survey that will appear uh, after this uh, webinar concludes. And uh, thanks again, everyone, and we look forward to having you on a future webinar. <laughs>